We're back, this is Dave Vellante, and we're here at the EIC, it's the MIT event, uh, the workshop on cybersecurity and, and governance and really the gap between international relations and advancements in cyber cyberspace. I'm here with Charlie Sennett, uh, the Global Post, and, and Jeff Kelly. Charlie, I want to start with you. Uh, founding editor of the, the Global Post. It's uh, how many years in now? Uh, five years. Five years. Uh, Almost to the day, January 9th. Uh, right, it was early, early yeah. of the year, I remember that. So first of all, congratulations. Thanks. Uh, just absolutely amazing property that you guys have, have developed. I mean, the vision, when I first talked to you about the Global Post, you, you basically said, we are gonna basically cover like BBC covers, except from a, a, a U.S. Right. perspective, but around the globe. Right. And that's what you've successfully done. I remember you were traveling like crazy. You still travel like crazy. But you basically signed up correspondents right. in, in how many countries? We, we had about 50 correspondents approximately when we started out. We now have 70 correspondents in 50 countries. Um, not all of them full-time. Only, only about 18 are full-time. But we have um, basically tried to develop a network, a sort of confederacy of the great correspondents who are out there, who are all underemployed, and in many cases before us were unemployed, from the old news organizations that have cut down on their foreign coverage. We've been really fortunate to pick up a lot of great young talent, even some, some real veteran correspondents, and build a great team. And uh, our editors in Boston are also great. We really have an, an impressive team. So what's happening in, in, in your business? I mean, you're, you're talking about the, the large media properties cutting down on their foreign coverage. I mean, obviously we all know well what's happening in, in, in that business and advertising revenues and so forth. Is, is just, there wasn't the appetite for, for international coverage? I mean, you guys are, aren't you proving that that's not the case? I don't know if we're proving that's not the case because we have a much more stealth model of coverage. So we can afford to put these correspondents all over the world. The old model of the great newspapers, like the one I worked for, the Boston Globe, or the New York Times, or the Washington Post, the idea that they would fund correspondents who would be some of their most senior reporters to live overseas and then do a parachute model. So you'd have one regional correspondent, and then that correspondent would fly into each country where a crisis was happening, or an earthquake, or interesting diplomatic event, or whatever. That model was really expensive. So we ch we we re we recognize and that's what that you used to do. I mean, you helped that invent I did that, that for, model, yeah, right? <laughs> for years. I, I was lucky enough to get to do that model. It was a lot of fun. No, but then what happened was the internet came along. It really challenged traditional media in a lot of ways commercially. You know, as we all know, the newspapers had they they really saw uh, the internet come in and eat their lunch. I mean, it took away classified ads. It changed the model. It presented great economic challenges for the old school news organizations, newspapers first, now network television, I think is undergoing some of the similar strains. And as a result, what they did is they really scaled back on their foreign operations. We saw that as an opportunity. Um, when the Boston Globe, New York Newsday, Baltimore Sun, Chicago Tribune, all these great old newspapers shut down their foreign bureaus, including my alma mater, Boston Globe, we thought, well, wow, let's start a new digital news organization, fully online and we'll build a team of correspondents around the world. So that's what we've done. We've, we've been at it for five years. We, we've been recognized in the industry. We've won the Polk Award, the Peabody Award. We've won the Overseas Press Club Awards. And we've, we've shown, I think, that we can punch above our weight class um, just by having great correspondents who live in the countries they cover. That's the key. So no more parachuting in. These are correspondents who live there, typically who speak the language, or at least we really look for that. Um, and yeah, we're trying to just just change the model. Well, you're a, you're, you're a rock star, Charlie, I and mean, you're very modest about this. We you always talk about tech athletes, right, Jeff, on the cube. You're like a geopolitical athlete. You know? so, I mean, you've been, I mean. With you know, really bad knees Iraq, and legs that are going. Yeah, right, yeah, but you know, maybe. you got shoulder problems, but you know, <laughs> Afghanistan, Iraq. Now, now, the, yeah. now, the, now the, the cool thing is um, with Global Post, you do some really interesting projects. I mean, you essentially you know, just did Egypt with yep. Frontline. Yep. That was an amazing program. I mean, I watched sure. my, my jaw open. You did a stint in Burma. I want you to talk about that yep. little nonprofit model that you have going. Yep. Uh, you just got back from Nigeria, yep. right? So let's, let's, actually, let's start with the whole sort of nonprofit thing that you have going mm -hmm. and, and what you did in, in Burma. Yeah. Well, so for five years, Global Post has been out there. We're a for-profit company. We really tried to develop revenue streams, the primary one being online advertising. Uh, we have some other streams, including syndication, that are important. But basically, we've tried to come at this as we want to be self-sustaining, we want to be profitable. About two years ago, um, I began to also add a 
different kind of approach to sustaining our coverage, which is to go after foundation support. So I went after some money from the Ford Foundation, from the Luce Foundation, from the Kaiser Foundation, and they were very receptive to us because they see a news organization that's trying to be self-sustaining, so therefore won't have our hand out forever, and that this would be something to fund and get behind. So much like Ford Foundation would fund National Public Radio, they saw no conflict in funding a startup that is not yet profitable, that's trying to get there, and that we're well on our way, but we really want to have greater ambitions than what we could afford where we are right now in the business. So we were able to raise this money, um, and, and that has allowed us to do a lot of in-depth reporting, investigative reporting that we otherwise couldn't afford, um, and a lot of reporting on important social justice issues that are not classically the kinds of things that you know corporate advertising wants to get behind. Right. These, are, these are the toughest issues of the day that we can go at, and, and a secondary, and really important part of this is we get to have fellowships and train the next generation of foreign correspondents. So we've gotten some funding to really do that. that. That's what took us to Burma. That's what took us to Egypt first when we did the big fellowship there. And we're doing a sort of, not, not unlike the Cube, we're trying to do these pop-up newsrooms all around the world where we go into a really complicated story. We put a lot of talented young people on the ground. We surround them with mentors, editors, um, you know, video editors, photo editors, writing editors, and then we try to get them to work together. So we had 10 Burmese correspondents and 10 American correspondents interested in Burma working together, covering Burma all summer. For several, several weeks, right? Yeah, culminating with uh, Aung San Suu Kyi coming and speaking to the group, and we, we did a sit-down interview with her, which was excellent. And um, really exciting to be in a country that's so much in the news, such an important country to understand. Well, you t talk about this, you know, undercover, this whole notion of cyber yeah. security and the governance gap, it's, it's really not covered, I know, in, in, in our industry and certainly not yours. It's an interesting intersection. It We'd is. We'd love to figure out a way to, to collaborate here. And John Furrier, you know, launched uh, Silicon Academy <coughs> with yeah. that sort of vision in mind. You've got, you know, your thing going. And it's, this, there's, a, there's a real, I think, need for coverage here, don't you? I, I, I completely agree. This has been an incredibly eye-opening day. One, to watch Wikibon and the Cube in action, and you, I gotta say, I've been on a lot of television shows. You you really have it. You have that ability to engage, get people yeah, talking. Yeah. So I, uh, I really, you know I mean that. You know I'd give you a hard time if I could. But I, I think that seriously, this model, this sort of stealth model of coming in and covering conferences where these really big ideas are being discussed is exciting. I think it's a lot like what we're trying to do on a news organization side of things. Specifically at this conference, um, as an editor, I'm stunned how little we know about this. Like We are not following cybersecurity closely enough. Think how many resources we put behind covering national security without having someone who's really looking at cybersecurity, which is increasingly the whole ballgame. So I think I've learned a lot here today. I've learned that we've got to pay a lot more attention to this topic. I think there's a lot of potential to do good, in-depth reporting around the world on this issue of governance and who owns the internet, who's going to control it, who's going to be the policeman I said, for this yeah, I thought it was Google. <laughs> now, I know you got to go, but so uh, you got a story I want you to share about, you guys got hit for your coverage, in, in, you're yeah. covering Syria with critical yeah. eye. So what happened? Well, look, Syria is, a, is probably the most dangerous assignment in my lifetime. I've covered Iraq. Wow, that's saying a lot, given your lifetime. <laughs> I, I, you know, I reported in Lebanon. I've reported the two intifadas. I reported in Medellin, Colombia, the troubles in Northern Ireland, Iraq, Afghanistan. Syria is really a black hole. As you know, we have a correspondent still missing. Yep. Jim Foley is still missing over there. We've taken big risks, a lot of courageous reporting to be in Syria. As a result, we've done some very good reporting. Um, and as a result, we became a target. So once you start punching in that way class where you're actually breaking some news about the regime and human rights abuses and chemical weapons use, they start to come at you. And we experienced this. So the uh, Syrian Electronic Army targeted Global Post. I guess you could take it as a strange badge of honor. Uh, they went after the New York Times as well. And um, you know, yeah, they had some effect. We're a small news organization, and I think we all would say collectively that we weren't paying enough attention to our own security. So I've also learned a lot here today about sort of how even little guys like us, small news organizations, how we need to be much more attentive. And I think we learned that the hard way. Um, our team recovered beautifully, I've got to say. They really were on it. We quickly uh, uh, had it taken care of. We quickly instituted a multi-step security process to try to prevent that from ever happening again. 
um, but lesson learned, and we have. A, I'm sure we have a lot more lessons to learn. Okay, but you could largely were on your own, right? I mean, it's not like yeah. you could go to some you know, government agency or some police force and say, "Hey, this yeah. is what happened." Well, I think you no. you can call in government agencies, yeah. uh, you know, and and many news organizations, including ours, do. You ident you do notify sure. authorities yeah, that you've then been attacked. What happens? You don't really know. Well, you're sort of on your own to figure out how to lock it down. But no, I think they offered some practical advice, yeah, okay. and I, I do think there was some some practical advice there. Uh, so Charlie, I'm curious, yeah. over your long career, yeah. uh, obviously we cover technology here, enterprise tech, right. uh, but just in general, not just enterprise, but consumer tech, technology of all sorts, mm -hmm. how has that impacted foreign journalism, both as a topic to cover and also right. as how you do your job? Well, I mean, it's changed the game completely because now the barrier for entry to own your own news organization is lower than it's ever been in the history of man, right? I mean, you don't have to own a printing press. You don't have to own a network. You can build a constellation of, of really talented correspondents, and you can then go out and get a URL, and you can go online, and you can have your team, and you can be up and running. Funding has been the great challenge, that the the hardest thing in with all of the technology advances is how do we find the right business model to sustain in-depth coverage of the caliber that, that we want to have. Uh, that's something we're thinking through every day, and we've we've sort of veered, as Dave pointed out, we've veered a little bit towards this hybrid model, where we're going for online advertising, but we're also looking at foundation support. We want to be very nimble. We want to think about this from as many angles as we can. Um, I think, you know, more practically speaking, from the field, it's incredible what what you can do now in terms of being wired into a story while you're on the story. So I used to have to do, you know, like the old-fashioned exercise of going down into the library of, of the Boston Globe, what they called the morgue, <laughs> where they kept the clips. Remember when people would be down there cutting I clips? Physically clipping? They had yeah. a whole team physically clipping. And I used to have to photocopy all the clips and then jump on a plane with a big fat stack of paper and go try to figure it out. And I, I can remember very, very memorably in 1993, not that long ago, um, covering the first World Trade Center bombing and doing all those clips and then leaving for the Sudan where some of the attackers in the first World Trade Center bombing were from without realizing we were on to nascent Al-Qaeda but having a little tiny photocopy of a clip that mentioned that there was a scion of a construction company named Osama bin Laden who may have financed this operation. Uh, but that's impossible, the clip went on to say, because he was with the CIA working with the Mujahideen mm. in the war against the Soviets in Afghanistan. So the they clip, were the good guys back yeah, the, then. Yeah. The, 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 clip, <laughs> so. the idea of clips is so recent, I can still feel them in my hand. Yeah. What I do now in the field is I'm in touch with a Twitter feed. For example, you compare my early days of reporting on what became known as Al-Qaeda to the Arab Spring, where I was on the ground uh, in Egypt a lot. I was there for most, almost the entire revolution in Egypt, the, in Tahrir Square, and I could be on a live Twitter feed with this phone, and I'm tapped into, you know, 50, 60 excellent bloggers, mm -hmm. citizen journalists inside Tahrir Square, watching what they're discussing and pinging around, and these were the people who made this revolution happen. These were the Thomas Paines, if you will, of their revolution. And uh, all of that available on a phone, all of it available just by going you know, straight online, uh, hijacking some wireless or going 3G and running up my data bill, but getting, getting the feeds, <laughs> right? Yep. That's amazing. To, to take it even further, I can do a video with this, mm -hmm. a photo, audio recordings, we can put them up right onto an FTP and we're off to the races in terms of multimedia. So technology advances are so breathless these days that I think most news organizations, including ours, we can't really even keep up with them. They're literally changing every month. So smaller news organizations may have a benefit in this foot mm -hmm. race because we're not wedded to one big fat technology like broadcast television or the printed product. And I, I think in the long run, we're gonna do well in this race because we can be nimble, we can shift, but we're gonna have to remember to keep doing that. I think there might be an analogy here with startups that can now get online well, and start a company because of you know AWS or the cloud. Yeah, yeah. They don't need to invest on all that. Solve on agility. Journalism That's can really true. Can love it. Yeah. Yeah. Glass, Glass, rock fights, and, yeah. and agility. <laughs> Charlie, so accomplished. It's really been a pleasure working Thanks, with you Dave. today. Great, great to be on. Thanks coming for on. Me. All right, the planes are backing up here. Uh, we're okay. live at MIT. We're right back after this word. This is the Cube.